Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. This is the Terrain episode, which I promised you folks earlier, part two in a three-part series called Getting on the Grid. But before we get there, there's some bookkeeping I wanna do. We made the front page of Reddit the other day, slash r slash videos. It was the Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons videos, and I think it was kind of billed in the Reddit thread as being an intro to the game, which it isn't really, right? The video doesn't explain how to play D&D or indeed what it is. It sort of assumes that you have friends that can answer those questions. But the comments were overwhelmingly positive. It was really refreshing and surprising. I know Reddit has a certain reputation, but I do not find it thus. In fact, I think the only negative responses we got were people who were questioning whether the hair and beard were real and whether or not the voice was real. And so for those people who are watching and who are suspicious that this isn't my real voice. Of course, it's not. I put the voice, this is how quickly I talk, but I do put the voice through a processor. I use a program called Adobe Audition. And this is what it sounds like when I don't process it and I don't turn on the podcast voice option. I mean, I know there are people that say, oh, I like your natural voice better, but I do not. And they're my videos, so we're sticking with podcast voice. Also, Geek and Sundry linked to that video, which was super cool. Got a whole bunch of new followers on Twitter, at Matt Colville. And with that came a bunch of new questions, of course. People like asking me questions on Twitter, I enjoy answering. And it's always interesting to me that people have what they feel are intractable problems, like somebody who asked about a player's girlfriend who wants to play, but just wants to play a dragon. And is that even possible? And I said, sure, absolutely, as long as she doesn't mind playing a first level dragon who can't fly and has about 12 hit points. And then I posted this, which is a quote from Gary Gygax from the original rules to Dungeons and Dragons back in 1974, where he said, look, people are gonna wanna play all sorts of crazy stuff, including a dragon. Go ahead and let them just make sure that you, the dungeon master, create what is a first level equivalent and just keep in mind what, you know, what is a fighter like? What is a wizard like? How powerful are they at first level? Make your player's dragon about that powerful. It's always fun to me to see that even 1974, even the very first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, they had already been struggling with these problems and had answers to them. Stuff that we think is super esoteric and edge case was the kind of stuff they were dealing with all the time back then. That's kind of the theme of this series is that every style of play, every problem, every solution that's come up over the past 40 years of Dungeons and Dragons is still relevant today. The way people played back then is still fun. The way people play now is fun. So that was cool, making Reddit's front page and Geek and Sundry. Also on Twitter, user Mathesius, who I'm probably pronouncing their, their handle wrong, sent me this, having watched the stream uh, and watching my monster manual fall apart live on Twitch, sent me a new monster manual, which is super awesome. Thank you very much. I immediately put it to use and I gave my friend Lars my old monster manual because I'm encouraging him to be a dungeon master. I think he's a natural. Also, I got a great letter in the mail from Craig Robinson. Very cool. Thank you very much, Craig. He sent me a D20 that he found when he went online looking for uh, Night Below. And of course, there's an adventure called Night Below, which I've been running, but there was also a set of D&D miniatures called Night Below. And if you bought those, there was a chance you would get one of these cool D20s. It's unique. It's got a little gateway on the front, like it's the gate to the Underdark. So that was super cool. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you for your letter. It was heartfelt. I read the entire thing. I'm incredibly grateful to people that send me stuff like that. They send it to my Turtle Rock Studios address, which you can sort of find online if you know where to look, but I don't really encourage, you know, I'm not partnered with like Geek and Sundry. Fans of Critical Role can just send Geek and Sundry stuff and be certain that uh, Critical Role will get it, whereas I'm just, uh, you know, an average citizen. So people send stuff to my work address, which they have to go look up online, which is kind of weird. If you want to help support the channel, I encourage you to just come by my Amazon page and the doobly-doo and check out my fantasy novels. I have two books uh, and people have read them and liked them and you might too, who knows? Otherwise, if you wanna help support the channel, just share my videos with your friends. I mean, that's the only, viral marketing is the only marketing I have. That's true of my videos, that's true of my books. I like being direct to you. I don't like having people between the creator and the audience. That's why I'm so, That's why I'm an independent fantasy author. I've never tried to get an agent. I've never tried to get an editor or go through a publisher. I don't like having folks between me and you. So if you wanna help support the channel, just share these videos with your friends. We've had a couple of videos recently. We had the information video. We had the Welcome to Dungeons and Dragons video that were pretty high level abstract stuff and I wanted to do a video that was a little bit less heady. That's headly! No, not that heady. You know, the machine, it gets impatient. It hasn't been used in a long time. I wanted to do something a little bit more down to earth. So we're continuing the Getting on the Grid series. We're gonna do three videos. We already did the first one, which is where to get miniatures. And the third one, which is the video I really wanted to do is how to run tactical combat. But I didn't wanna go straight to the tactical combat episode because this is a series for new DMs. And so I didn't wanna presume that you had miniatures or a grid. We did the miniatures video. This is the grid video. And because I have no idea how long these videos are gonna be while I'm recording them, I wanna put my best advice up front. And I think my best advice is typically the cheapest and most straight straightforward. And obviously the cheapest and most straightforward way to run D&D is not have any miniatures. You don't need to run tactical combat. You can do it all in your head. You can just describe what's happening to your players like they're all medieval peasants sitting around the campfire listening to the storyteller. 
Lots of people play D&D that way without using any miniatures at all, and I believe that they have fun. I am not one of those people. I enjoy the grid. I enjoy tactical combat. I enjoy that war gamey feeling. So you don't need miniatures in a grid, but if you're going to use them, probably the cheapest way to get on the grid once you've got your minis is to get some of this, which is gaming paper. Uh, I love this stuff. I've used it quite a lot. It's basically wrapping paper. Of course, I'm going to screw the white balance up on my video here, right? Uh, it looks and sounds exactly like uh, wrapping paper because that's basically what it is. And as a result, it's really cheap. You can get tons of this stuff for less than 10 bucks. But the great thing is it's way better than regular wrapping paper. Obviously, it has a grid printed on it, but it also has clay baked into the paper. And as a result, it absorbs ink really well. You can write on it really easily way better than trying to write on actual wrapping paper. If you tried to write on actual wrapping paper with a dry erase or a wet erase pen, it would just smear all over the place, not this stuff. This stuff absorbs ink really quickly, and also because of the clay baked into it, it doesn't seep through on the other side, it doesn't bleed. So you get these really nice, clean, straight lines. And because it's so cheap, it's basically disposable. You can you know, uh, measure out however much you need for whatever it is you're doing that night, slice it off, draw what you need to draw, and then at the end of the night, the players can keep this. I've had players of mine keep the temple they explore because they turned it into their base. It's cheap, it's disposable, it's actually quite high quality. I recommend it. There's a link in the doobly-doo. There'll be links in the doobly-doo to all this stuff. And also, this is all stuff that I have spent my own money on and tried over the years. These are solutions that I enjoy and I recommend. I've actually had a couple of people contact me and ask me to endorse their stuff. And I always say no, just because I feel like part of the contract here between us is that all the stuff I recommend is stuff that I have found organically and I have used. As soon as somebody sends me free stuff to evaluate, now there's an X factor in my recommendation. Even if I like it, it's something, it's not something that I spent my own money on and I found on my own. So there's a bias built in, which I would like to remove. So gaming paper is super cool. Probably the next cheapest, most straightforward solution is one of these. This is a vinyl battle mat. I don't have one of these anymore because we would go through these like once every three or five years. That's plenty of time for most people. These are designed to be used with wet erase pens. So you draw on them and you have to be very careful because inevitably somebody draws on one of these with either a dry erase pen or a permanent marker, in which case now forevermore, you have perma room, right? You have this one room in the dungeon that's never going to erase again. And also one of the things that happens, and this is true of a couple of solutions here, is that every time you erase this, some of the ink uh, stays in there. And it's actually difficult over the years to get it all out and it stains and the grid fades. And so eventually you throw it out and get a new one, but they're pretty cheap. And because they're vinyl with a cloth backing, they roll up really easily. You can throw them in your car. You can throw them in your bag. You don't have to worry about folding them or creasing them. They basically can't be creased. They're a great cheap solution. They're a little bit more expensive than gaming paper. They're not disposable, but it will last you, like I said, three to five years. Okay, the next solution, and one that I often get a lot of comments on when I post uh, pictures of my D&D game on Twitter, is this stuff. These are tactiles, and they're made by, I'll put a link in the doobly-doo, and they are, you can tell they're a grid, and they are dry erase. You can get some dry erase pens, and you can write on these, and they'll erase. But like the vinyl mat, over time, these things absorb the ink, and so eventually they'll be stained, and you can't get them clean, you'll have to go buy some new ones, but they're super cool. And as you can see, they link together. I gotta be careful here with my, wait, wait, hang on. There we go. I gotta be careful with my microphone. So you can either see me or you can hear me, but not both. Uh, these are great. You get like, I think 16 of them. And because they're modular and you can fit them together however you want, you can build the dungeon out in whatever direction the players go, right? You don't end up with this uh, square, like with the vinyl or a rectangle, like with the gaming paper, you can make an L shaped or whatever shape. You can start with something small, right? You can draw the entrance to the, I keep saying dungeon. Dungeon. Obviously, it's not always a dungeon. It's sometimes it's out in the wilderness, whatever. But anytime you're doing tactical combat, you can start with just one tile. You can draw where the players are. And then wherever they explore, you can build tiles out. Like all the wet erase, dry erase solutions that you can actually erase, as opposed to the gaming paper, these will wear out over time. They do absorb ink over time. I think there's a finish on them that makes them dry erase. And every time you erase it, you get a little bit of that finish off. I'm not sure. But I recommend them. They're super cool. Everybody loves them. They're easy to use. They pack up easy. Our grid-based solutions are going up both in cost and in presentation. They're going to get prettier and prettier as we go. And the next neatest thing, I think, the next most straightforward way to do stuff is using this stuff. This is one of uh, Wizards of the Coast official dungeon tiles. And I believe these are, this is a big tile. The tiles come in all different shapes and sizes. There are door tiles. There are small corridor tiles. There's pretty much everything you could ever want. And you can get them all on eBay. There are tons of these things. They're really high quality. They last forever. And I believe that they are dry erase. I believe you can draw on these should you need to. But I've never really felt the need to. And this is a generic tile. On the back is this cool in, right? So there are special tiles. Each special tile has on the back of it a generic tile, which is a great way to produce a lot of content relatively cheaply, right? You get this, which is a, uh, a room 
room with a bunch of magic runes on it. Or on the other side, you have the top of a keep, right? Depending on what you need. Now, these are big special purpose tiles and they're very pretty, I think. They look really cool, but there are lots of really tiny uh, general purpose tiles you can get. I just grabbed these because I think they look really cool. So the Waxy dungeon tiles are fantastic. I love them. The only problem is you end up with a whole bunch of them. It can be hard to get the one you want when you want it because there's really no way to store these things other than to put them in a big you know, box or something. That's kind of the curse of these tiles is that all the other solutions are relatively straightforward to store and put away and get back. But the Watsy dungeon tiles, you end up buying a whole bunch of them because they're really pretty and they're really neat and you imagine you're gonna use all the different sets. But then when it actually comes time to find the tile you need, it can kind of be a pain in the butt. Wizards of the Coast also makes these cool battle mats. These are pre-printed, they're not modular. They're not tiles that are meant to be mixed and matched. They are, they are themed. They look like this when you get them, you open them up, you unfold them and they have some big structure on it. Like this is the underground fortress. It's a big dungeon on the other side. They're double-sided on the other side is a keep. You can see it's a huge keep and you can use different bits of it. You can fold it so the players can only see one part of it. And they're themed and you get different packs that have you know wilderness ones, outdoor ones, indoor ones. Uh, here's what one of the outdoor ones looks like. Right, you can fold it so you just see this map if you need an outdoor map, or you can use this big castle, which this outdoor part is just one component of. These are really cool. I think Paizo also makes a whole bunch of really cool uh, battle mats. There's a lot of solutions for these. They're pretty, but the battle mats tend to be, you know, it's like I said, special purpose. The tiles are more generic and let you do more things. I've used both, they're both cool. I recommend all of them. Also, as I said, check out Paizo's website. They have tons of great battle mats. So we've talked about a couple of different grid solutions. We started off with the generic stuff that looks basically like big graph paper. And now we start talking about stuff that looks more presentable, that looks more immersive, right? One of my favorite grid-based solutions I think is incredibly immersive, and that's these things. These are off-the-track ceramic tiles. Off-the-track is the name of the company. I have tons of these things. I bought them from my friend Jim. He bought them back in 1981. This is a two-by-two two tile. And I've, oh, I'll, I'll see if I can put up a picture of what it looks like when I use them over here. I think these are fantastic. They are uh, painted. They didn't come this way. They came, you know, white and you can't really find them anymore. I have no idea where they came from. I think these look fantastic. And these are the other solution that when I take pictures of this stuff and post it on Twitter, people are like, whoa, where'd you get those tiles? And it's like, look, I hate to tell you, um, but they're from a company that doesn't exist anymore, probably only existed for about an hour and a half back in 1981 called Off the Track. My friend Jim bought a bunch of them. They don't come painted. He painted them. I love his paint job. And they just look really real to me. Like there's something about these tiles. I've got a whole stack of them and they have doorways and all sorts of cool stuff that to me look like real dungeon flagstones. So if you can find them or if you have some, I encourage you to post in the doobly-doo. Uh, I think they're spectacular. Unfortunately, nobody makes these anymore. Maybe somebody watching this video has the molds for these and they'll dig them out of their attic or their basement and say, hey, I could start making some money off of these and they'll start casting them again because if they did that, I would buy some more. Off the track tiles I think are gorgeous, but they're basically impossible to find. Almost as good are these. these these are the, many people recognize these, these are the Dwarven Forge dungeon tiles. And like the off the track tiles, these are entirely modular, right? You buy a whole bunch of these. They come in different shapes and sizes. You can see a bunch of them here. These are my favorites. These are the actual resin tiles that Dwarven Forge used to sell a million years ago. They've switched a lot of their tiles to what they call Dwarvenite. This is an example of a Dwarvenite tile. You can see it's a little um, crossbow slit. And I bought, I kickstarted a bunch of these, so I've got a ton of it, but I don't really use it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I'm just, I just think that the classic resin looks better. I think it looks more authentic. This looks like it's plastic. If you only used these and you never saw these, I think you would think these were really cool. They're hand painted. They look pretty good. They're also indestructible. You can drop these and run one over with your car and it'll look fine when you're done. Dwarven Forge makes lots of different tile sets. They make normal dungeon tiles. This is meant to be the flagstones of like, you know, a castle or whatever. And they also make underground stuff. They have rivers and stalactites that look really cool. This is meant to be kind of unworked stone. The only problem with Dwarven Forge stuff, and you can kind of see it here, is that it blocks line of sight, right? If you're playing with these and you have it all set up, you have your dungeon all set up and you start putting miniatures in it, it becomes impossible to see the miniatures unless you're looking directly overhead. Like right now, like how, how hard is it? It gets really difficult to see that there's a mini in here. And of course, keep in mind that there's another wall over here, right? If you're building the dungeon, you know, completely. So what I end up doing is I just buy these and use these, but unfortunately they don't sell the two by two tiles a la carte. At least I don't think they do. They might, maybe they do now. I'll put a link to Dwarven Forge and the doobly-doo. And if you can buy the two by two tiles, that's what I recommend. Of course, if you want the uh, 3D tiles, if you don't mind having your line of sight blocked, go right ahead. And obviously you can use these sparingly, right? You can use these to map out the dungeon and make a floor and then use these for little kind of um, boutique uh, tiles. Like if you just need to 
show where the arrow slit is. You can also get, I've never done this, but I've always kind of wanted to. You can go to a company called Hearst Arts, and I'll put a link again in the doobly-doo. This is what their stuff looks like. What you get is you get molds for dungeon tiles and doorways and stuff like that. And then you go online and you buy dental plaster, which is really cheap, and you can pour, mix and pour your own tiles. I have lots of friends that do that. It looks really cool. One of the things I love about Dungeons and Dragons is the way that as a hobby, it encompasses all of these different disciplines depending on how you want to get into it, right? Writing and world building and improvisational acting and painting and even if you want sculpting and all sorts of cool stuff. So if you want to try and make your own dungeon tiles and then paint them yourselves, I encourage you to do so. I, like I said, I have friends that use the Hearthstar stuff and they really like it. It's just neat to make your own stuff. Of course, because Dungeons and Dragons is a 25 to 30 millimeter scale fantasy game, any fantasy terrain out there for stuff like Warhammer Fantasy will work. Like I got these great hills. This is a huge set of hills I got. There's tons more. It comes in a big bag. It's made by a company called Warzone, I believe. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo. And it's modular. You can set these however you want. You can create line of sight blockers. You can create little valleys and canyons. It's really cool. You know, I like using M&Ms or unpainted lead just because it makes the players use their imagination more and that makes it feel more real. But I also like impressing my players with how cool the terrain looks. And I think this stuff looks fantastic. You can also get trees that are the right scale that look really cool and will really make your outdoor adventures feel more immersive. There's a company called Pegasus Hobbies that makes a bunch of pre-painted terrain. This is a plastic river that you can get and will actually like snap together if you are careful and don't screw it up. There, I just put a bend in the river and this is neat again for outdoor adventures. It's light, it looks pretty good and when you're done with it, you can just take it apart and store it. It's really easy to store. Pegasus Hobbies also makes stuff like this. This is a great, uh, this is the chaos symbol from I think uh, it's from Warhammer, but actually they stole it obviously from Michael Moorcock. So I think this is meant to be like a Warhammer Fantasy or Warhammer 40k prop, but I used this when my players fought Calarol the Vile and he had some heroes that he had tied up to this. This is where the Black Gate was where he's trying to summon Orcus. And unfortunately, I've actually dropped this a couple times and broken it. So you can see there are little bits of white on here, but here's an important lesson. Anytime you have terrain or miniatures that get chips or breaks in them, you can often fix these just with markers. Just go get one of those big rainbow color marker sets and you can find the right color and just touch this up and players won't even notice, especially when it's on the table. Table. It'll look really cool. They're not going to look at it up close like this for more than a couple seconds and then put it back down on the table. So on the table, you can get away with just touching these things up with markers. Another cool terrain option, and again, this gets into how much crafting there is in Dungeons and Dragons. What a neat hobby it is, is you can do paper craft stuff, which I strongly recommend. This is kind of one of the pride and joys of my collection. I've taken up, oh, you can see the bookcase fell over. Some of these pieces are glued in here and some of them are freestanding, which lets you move them around. Uh, this is a paper craft tavern. Let's see if I can back up and get you the whole. This is just one room, by the way. I've several rooms here in this tavern. I'll try to post a link over here to the whole picture of it entirely assembled. This took me a couple of weekends to put together. It's a set I got from Fat Dragon Games. Again, I'll put a link in the doobly-doo. And they make lots of cool terrain solutions. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed putting this together. I look forward to doing more. And of course, having done it once, I'll be using this tavern, you know, probably for the rest of my life. Here you see like a bedroom add-on with a couple of beds in it, and it uses a uh, foam core on the bottom, which you then print out just on regular paper. You print out the flooring and you use spray adhesive. This stuff, you spray adhesive the uh, paper printed out to the foam core floor, and then all of the walls and, the, and all the furniture is all done with cardstock, right? You print stuff out on cardstock, and then you fold it and cut it, and you need a cutting board, you need an X-Acto knife. This is the cutting board I use. It's meant for X-Acto knives. It's called self-healing. It's double-sided. You know, I've gotten a lot of glue on this thing, so it's all scratched up. You also need some glue. You need some white glue, but don't get Elmer's glue because I didn't know this until I started doing paper craft stuff. Elmer's glue is basically for children. And for what you want, you need this special tacky glue, which is white glue, but it's it's like super glue for paper. Like as soon as you glue two pieces of paper with this, it is inst almost instantly glued. So you get yourself a set of these, you print them out, and you can uh, take the rooms apart and put them back together using toothpicks that get set into the foam core floor and that way you can make whatever shape tavern you want. Get yourself a set of this from uh, Fat Dragon Games and it has instructions and there are videos online for how to assemble these things. I had a lot of fun doing it. I look forward to building like a whole town using this stuff. It's also really light and it's easy to carry. It's not exactly easy to store. You need a special place to put it, unlike tiles, which you can basically stack up and put in whatever kind of container you've got. Finally, I saved the best and most expensive stuff for last. These are custom terrain pieces that I bought on eBay and I just looked up terrain for D&D and look, it's got... Look at this. Look how cool this is. It's got little lights on it. The doors actually open. I have no idea. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo if I can find the seller. I think the guy's in Europe somewhere. I think he might be in Spain or Italy. And I love this guy's stuff. I have no idea how he makes this. I think he's using Hearst Arts mold and he just puts electronics in the bottom. There are little batteries in here. 
I think I bought this three or four years ago and how often do I use it? You know, I use it once every couple of months and as a result, the batteries have never run out. I bought a lot of stuff from this guy. Uh, I don't remember it being super expensive, but that may just have been my perception of it considering it was handmade. This is the pride and joy of my miniature collection. Look at this thing. Look at that. This is the front of some, I, I took the doors out. I have the doors there at work. This is the front of a castle or keep. And of course the light lights up. Look at that little thing and it blinks. That's not the batteries running low. That is whatever circuit the guy used uh, deliberately flickering like it's torchlight. And it's 3D so you get like these nice stairs. There's a nice walkway over here. I thought this stuff was fantastic. I bought a ton of dungeon dressing from the guy. I got this little 3D piece. I have no idea where he got this or how he made it. I think it's hand painted. This might be more Hearst art stuff. I'm not sure. I got this cool like uh, this is a table with the uh, Dwarven Forge plastic table. But you can see I've got a little map here the guy made. It's a metal map. It's got a little like uh, X marks the spot thing on it. So as you can see, you can kind of go crazy with this stuff, right? There's a lot of solutions. Some of them are cheap and effective. Some of them are more expensive, but something like this is something I'm going to be using again for the rest of my life. I don't mind investing money in this stuff because Dungeons and Dragons is my hobby. I've been doing it since I was 16 and I'm only getting better at it, right? And it's getting more popular. So investing in something like this, it pays off over time. That's the terrain episode, folks. The next in this series, although probably not the next video I'm going to make, is going to be the actual running combat episode. I think we're probably going to do that inside Fantasy Grounds because it's the easiest way, I think, to show you the grid and the decisions I make. We played D&D last week and I didn't do a campaign diary, so I owe you one of those. And we're about to play again next week, so I may end up being behind. But last week went really well. We'll talk about it soon. I will at some point do a review of Possession, which I watched and saw and thought was fantastic. And that is going to be, I did a review of uh, Ghostbusters and I did a review of Star Trek Beyond. But in both cases, I saw those movies. I enjoyed myself to one extent or another, but I didn't really feel like I had much insightful to say. And I don't usually like doing reviews of movies unless they made me think about something that I want to share. Possession definitely made me think... It's going to be a proper nerdy kind of movie snob review. A lot of people ask me to review Stranger Things, so I guess we'll probably do that. I watched it and I have a lot of thoughts about it. I watched the whole thing. I don't normally think of television as being my domain. It's not something I feel necessarily super comfortable reviewing, but I have talked a lot about Stranger Things with my friends at work and my gaming buddies. So there's definitely something there probably worth doing a review. That's it, folks. The next video is either going to be the first in a series where we talk about different Dungeons and Dragons settings, complete worlds that you can go buy, which I do recommend doing. You can make your own or you can go buy one prepackaged. But in balance, I think buying a prepackaged world is the best use of your time. So we're either going to do the first video in the campaign setting series. And if we do, it's probably going to be this one, which I'm going to. This is a little teaser. This is one book for one campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons that we will talk about maybe next video. It's up to you. Either we'll do uh, this or we will do my Appendix N. A lot of people have asked about the books that have influenced me and the books I've referenced in the videos. There is a famous uh, glossary in the back of the original Dungeon Master's Guide called Appendix N that Gary Gygax wrote. And he basically just info dumped all the books that influenced him as a dungeon master and as a writer. And since then, we've gotten new appendix ends from new editions of D&D written by other folks. And so either I'll do my first in the D&D settings series, or we'll talk about the stuff that has influenced me. That's up to you. Let me know what you think. Come follow me on Twitter at Matt Colville. I also have my own subreddit slash r slash Matt Colville, which is great for long form discussions. As always, I am an independent fantasy author. That means I write novels and sell them direct to you on Amazon. I've written two fantasy novels so far. They're each four bucks, of which I see three bucks. So if you buy both books, you're sending me six bucks. A lot of people have read them. And if you go check out the reviews on Amazon, you'll see they're overwhelmingly positive, which kind of blows my mind. I have to assume the people that didn't like it were like, well, I'm not going to write a bad review. So let's just assume that there are people that didn't like it and they were just being nice and didn't write a bad review. Go check out the reviews and see if it's the kind of thing you would like. I think if you like playing Dungeons and Dragons, you would like these books. All right, folks, we're going to do a campaign diary. Don't worry. We're also going to do a movie review, whether you like it or not. But the next running the game video is either going to be campaign setting number one, or it's going to be my appendix and the books that have influenced me. You let me know what you want to see. Until then, peace out.